Hey, and welcome to the Stand Attack Podcast, uh, Episode 10, Interactive Whiteboards, Part 2, recorded January 27, 2012. I'm Sean Beavers, and if this is your first time joining us for the Stand Attack Podcast, this is a bi-weekly podcast covering educational technology and best practices in and around the state of Ohio. And uh, before I introduce my two wonderful co-hosts, I would just like to mention that I was in a cake decorating contest with my daughter last night, and we won third place overall for our uh, cake, which was an ark. We made the uh, Noah's Ark. So very proud of it. Uh, Maybe we'll throw a picture up in the show notes, but uh, that ribbon is hanging on our fridge right now. So anyway, I'll throw it over to uh, Eric Kurtz, who I'm sure has some wonderful stuff to uh, tell you about what he's been doing. Oh, well, that's, that is, we, we need a picture of that. We absolutely have to have a picture of that. Um, we, we've done some fun cake decorating in the past as well. Uh, my son, Grant, for his birthday, uh, we made a, uh, a Death Star cake. So uh, it, was, it was kind of fun. Um, and we've done some other weird ones. But no, um, our crafting has been uh, Pinewood Derby cars recently. Uh, we've got a Pinewood Derby coming up here in just a bit for uh, Scouts. And so I got a Dremel for Christmas, and I've been Dremeling everything. It's, <laughs> it's really fun. Well, and the boys, too. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tool that even the kids can use. So, I was going to say, um, you haven't been Dremeling your boys, have you? Uh, <laughs> Thankfully, they haven't been dribbling themselves because that's the thing I always worry about. But you just, just set the dribble to a low speed, and honestly, even a little kid can use it and not harm themselves at all. It's actually a perfectly fine tool for that, which is good. Uh, but I uh, apologize. I'm a little under the weather today. Uh, whatever uh, Eric G. had last week somehow or two weeks ago, it came through the Hangout, <laughs> and I <laughs> caught it. I guess a real computer virus there, and now I am on about 10 different medications. So um, I'll do my best to hang in there. But uh, Eric Eric G., how are you doing? You feeling better this week? Yeah, you know, I am. Uh, Yesterday was uh, touch and go there, but as far as crafting, um, my family and I have been uh, working on a giant pile of Kleenexes because I have gotten them sick as well. So uh, the cool thing that we've been using, and uh, this is not my awesome thing of the week, but I do have to share it, Kleenex, which is the Kleenex of tissues, actually makes something called Cool Touch Tissues. So actually when you grab it, it is actually cooling. Uh, through, I'm sure, Elfin Magic. I'm not quite sure how they do it, but aloe, everything else, uh, really helps to uh, you know get the mucus going so and, and cool the nose. So, uh, other than that, we're great. And uh, thanks. All right. Well, uh, let's take a look at uh, this week's news and news that's happened over the last two weeks since our last episode. And uh, Eric Kurtz, I'll let you handle that. Sure, absolutely. Um, and, and again, if, if you're listening to this podcast and you're not in the state of Ohio, I you know apologize. This section may not apply as much to you, but please hang around. We're it's it's a, it's a short section, but it's always good information that we hope will will benefit folks that are in this area. Just three quick news items this week. The first is um, there's a uh, a technology conference coming up kind of different. Uh, They're calling it an unconference, the Ed Camp Columbus. That's going to be on March 3rd. And what it is is a free participant-driven event, which is PD for teachers by teachers. Uh, The idea is this. There are no sessions predetermined. They're determined on the day of the event, and anyone who shows up can present. So basically, uh, you just show up. It's from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's at Upper Arlington High School in Columbus, and you can register online. Um, It's at edcampcolumbus.wordpress.com. We'll have the link in the show notes as well. Kind of a unique uh, take on a technology conference. And... uh, um, I may try to swing down there and see what that's all about. I think that'd be kind of a, a fun event to see how that would work with with PD. Um, the uh, speaking of tech conferences, the second thing to mention, of course, is we do have the E Tech Tech Conference very, very, very close around the corner here. And this is more of a correction than an an announcement. Um, last time we mentioned about the tech coordinators meeting that would be taking place on Tuesday. Um, and I had mentioned it as February 15th. That was incorrect. Tuesday is actually Valentine's Day, uh, February 14th. And um, it, 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 in my defense, it did come that way in the press release. And so I was actually reading it right from the press release, and uh, the eTech folks are correcting that. So for clarification, Tuesday, February 14th is going to be a uh, tech coordinators meeting at the conference right after the keynote. And then following that, around either 115 or 145, we're not totally sure, that's when we do our live recording of the State of Tech. More information on that later on in the show. Hopefully, lots of people can join us for that live recording and actually become part of the show that day. That'll be awesome. Tuesday, February 14th. 
And then the last news item is um, a blended learning grant. You may remember this. If um, you were paying attention several months ago, there was a blended, le blended learning grant for Ohio that uh, got kind of pulled off uh, for a while. Uh, we don't know what really happened to it. It was out there, and then it, it, it disappeared. They said they had to retool it before putting it back out. It is coming back now. And so this is a grant that will give six schools up to $80,000 with a possibility of $50,000 more later uh, to basically roll out a blended learning project. So all that information is available on the eTech website. And again, we'll have the links there in the show notes. So uh, that's our news for this week, Sean. All right, and uh, I actually did find a picture very quickly here, so I'll just throw that up. And for those of you who uh, are not watching the video podcast, I'll, I will link this in the show notes. I'll throw it up on Photo Bucket or something. But there's there's the cake we made. Uh, I am very proud of it. I am. Uh, I'm going to be starting my own cable access show here pretty soon. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that yeah. is fantastic. I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, it's time for my favorite segment of our show, the awesome thing of the week. And my awesome thing of the week this week is a website. It's called My Classroom Window. I just um, found out about this. Uh, Web20 Classroom on Twitter posted this. They're just starting out. You can actually uh, earn points. Uh, and the basic premise is just to review educational technology, whether that's books, textbooks, uh, interactive whiteboards, which is what we're talking about today, laptops, anything and everything uh, that can be used in education, whether it's a Web 2.0 tool or, or uh, like I said, a piece of hardware. And um, they do have prizes. So first place is a MacBook Air. They have an iPod Touch, uh, a Kindle Fire, and also an Amazon gift card. So if you submit enough uh, reviews, uh, you can earn points. Uh, towards one of these different devices, and they're looking, to, I think, to get about 500 reviews by the end of February, I believe, but it's on the website. So I thought that was a really interesting idea, uh, you know, to have educators uh, review, you know, not only, like I said, hardware and software, but websites and blogs, and, uh, you know, that hopefully will be a, a community, or they'll grow that, and it'll be a good place to, to look for reviews. Anyway, I'll throw things over to uh, Eric C. for his awesome thing of the week. Excellent, thanks. Um, for mine, I'm going to be talking about um, an extension for the Chrome web browser. And Chrome is, again, becoming a much, much, much more popular browser, so hopefully this will apply to lots of folks. And if you haven't tried out Chrome, I really would encourage you to do so. A very fast, very uh, stable, very reliable browser. Here's the problem. There are still some websites out there that really are geared toward IE. I mean, that that's just a fact. Um, you know, folks developed things at a certain time with IE in mind, and they're using certain settings that are just specific to IE, and they don't quite follow the the standards that. Firefox and, uh, and and Chrome and, and, and other you know more standards compliant browsers are, are following, and so because of that, sometimes when you uh, bring up a browser, or excuse me, bring up a website in Chrome, it may not work properly. And normally that's not a big big deal, but it really caught us in a bad spot about a month ago. The uh, gradebook program we use. Um, went uh, well. It it got updated, and then Chrome got updated. So it was sort of like a, a a mixture there. When Chrome went up to version 16, it exposed sort of um, uh, an, an oddity in our gradebook package that that no longer worked properly because they were doing something that was more specific toward IE. And so out of nowhere, all you know how many hundreds of teachers in our district would go into the gradebook program, go to enter grades, and then the Chrome error screen would come up. Now, of course, it's that all snap screen, which I think is kind of a strange error message to get, but all of a sudden, everybody's getting this all snap screen on there, and their gradebook doesn't work, and so we had to tell people, uh, you're going to have to use IE until they get this patched. Well, they have gotten it patched, and that's good, but here's the idea. You don't have to completely leave Chrome and go over to using IE when you run across these sort of things. There's an extension called IE Tab, and I'll go ahead and pull that up here uh, so you guys can see that. Um, and it's in the Chrome Web Store. It's just called IE Tab, just the letters IE and the word Tab. You can find that very quickly there. And what it does is it installs this extension. Uh, so I'll just go over to like the Google Web page. And um, what you'll see is if I'm on any, any website out there anywhere, I get um, this little um, button up in my extensions here that looks like the Internet Explorer E. And if I click on that button, what it's going to do is it's going to reload the page I'm viewing right now 
inside of Chrome, it's going to reload it inside of IE inside of Chrome. And so basically it does like a little, a little IE inset there. So let me go ahead and click on the IE tab button and you'll see that it is now reloading the Google home page. But you'll see that now I've got this extra bar here, which is the IE uh, address bar. And so I'm running Internet Explorer inside of Chrome. Now that's good. Okay. So, you know, if I go to my, my grade book, I could say, well, be sure to click on the IE tab button and then it will reload it inside of there as IE and then the gradebook will work, which is fine, but of course you have to remember to do that each time. Well, one of the nice things is if you go into the settings for IE tab, you can set up all kinds of things including auto URLs, which means you can say every single time I go to this website, I know this website only works in IE. I could type in our grade package address there and I could add that and by default, as soon as I go to that gradebook package without even thinking about it, whoop, it's going to load up IE tab. And I can also go down and set the compatibility mode, whether it's 7, 8, or 9, which version of IE I want to, to, to imitate while I'm in there. So just another great way to, for people who have transitioned over to Chrome to be able to handle those few odd websites out there that still are more compatible with IE than they are with Chrome. So hopefully that will be helpful to some folks. Uh, Eric G., how about you? Uh, I actually cheated and did two real quick things. Um, one is, it's uh, as you know, I got an iPhone a while ago. I had to upgrade for my BlackBerry. Uh, I think the model was Turd, BlackBerry Turd. Um, but anyway, this is just a fun app, and so it's falling under the awesome thing of the week uh, for me. It is this little plastic gun. You take your iPhone or iPod Touch, you snap it into the top, and then uh, if you want to really make it look dangerous uh, or cool, you take this adjustment into the back and then it turns your iPhone into a gun. Now really what makes this fun is there's a little app that is like a shooting gallery. So it uses the accelerometer and um, actually the camera to simulate a shooting gallery. So as you pull the triggers, and this is actually pretty interesting, it's like two little styluses. So as I pull the triggers, it touches the screen like that. So it acts like a little gun and uh, yeah, it's a fun toy. My Three-year-old can't seem to leave it alone, so we now have a sharing schedule. Um, you should also that. mention you also knocked over 7-Eleven with that. Yes, uh, that guy never knew what hit him digitally, so uh, that was kind of uh, you know just a fun little thing. Uh, the 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 uh, company that makes that is called App Toys, and um, on their website they actually have the white version, and I bought the orange version because it was at Walmart. And as you can see, there are several different apps. One of them, uh, a few of them, use augmented reality. Uh, to work, but the one that I found that was the easiest and uh, funnest to use was the can uh, one, and it's actually you're shooting uh, a gallery. It's like a shooting gallery at a circus or something like that. Um, the other thing, real quick, and as we spoke last week, we talked about apps that worked with the iPad. Uh, Log me in has now switched it to free. Log me in free, and what they do is you can still download that app. And um, and install Log Me In on your computer, and it's sort of like using the Splash Top, but you know not the same. But now it's completely free. I know Sean. Uh, I think Splash Top costs maybe one or two bucks, something like that. But now Log Me In is is free. So oh five bucks, something like that. So, uh, but now Log Me In is free. And what they did one that I originally bought, which is called Log Me in Central, instead of that being $29.99, it's now $99.99. So I don't know why they jacked up the price, but you know this free version, definitely more compelling uh, to use. They've limited some of the features, but definitely you could still use it on an iPad or an iPod Touch. So those are just my awesome things of the week. Thanks. All right, well, let's dive right into our main topic today, and this is the second part of our interactive whiteboard series. If you remember, in the last episode of our podcast, we were talking about the different options available out there, and today we're really going to focus on how you can use uh, that interactive whiteboard in your classroom. You know, what are some of those best practices and the types of things that you can't do uh, with just a normal dry erase board or other pieces of technology? And uh, we're lucky today to have two uh, extremely special guests with us. We have David Sladke and Scott Miller uh, from Teaching with Smartboard Podcast. How are you guys doing? Very well. Very well. Thank you very much. Well, if you guys want to just uh, give a little introduction about yourselves and about your podcast. I'll go ahead and start. I'm Scott Miller. I'm the Instructional Coordinator for Mathematics at Naperville Central High School. 
Uh, been there for quite a few years. Uh, Dave and I both teach in the math department. Uh, an instructional coordinator is just a fancy term for a department chair. Uh, and we strive to integrate as much technology in the classroom as possible. Excellent. And I'm Dave Sladke. I uh, also teach at Naperville Central. I'm in the math department. Um, I, uh, I teach uh, one class of Intro to Algebra and I teach three classes of pre-calculus and I also am one part uh, tech for our math department. So we kind of spread around the wealth. We have uh, one position, uh, one course that we don't teach um, throughout. Uh, each department has one of those, kind of nice. Great, well let's uh, take a look at, I guess, some of the uses and different ways that interactive whiteboards can be used in the classroom. And if you guys want to start off thinking about how you've been using it for quite a while. You know what, um, here's my biggest thing with the smart board. I, I don't want it just to be a fancy whiteboard. This is, you know, classic that people think that you can, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a little nicer than a than an electronic whiteboard. Well, we want to actually change the pedagogy. We want to have students uh, get up to the board, move things around, things they couldn't do with uh, just a whiteboard. And um, so our big push is to have students teach other students. And so they're getting up in up in there. They're justifying their work. Um, they're they're participating with us. We're not just lecturing. It's not a fancy PowerPoint. That's not an interactive whiteboard. That's just a data projector. All right. So th that's our big push, and and everything we do throughout our podcast tries to, to get that point across. And I think that's one of, you know been one of the things that we've talked about is you know uh, when I taught uh, fourth and fifth grade, we had teachers who had interactive whiteboards, pretty much everybody in the, in the building, and they were using it, like you said, to show movies as, as a screen or, or to use it for PowerPoints, or, or Eric just mentioned earlier that, you know, um, he knows people who are using it just to advance their PowerPoint shows, so that's really not, you know, leveraging it as a, as a tool for change. Yeah, uh, the way that, I guess, we went about changes when we first looked at installing them, uh, we put them in experienced teachers' classrooms because uh, we knew that novice teachers being adept at technology would not have a whole lot of adjustment to getting used to using them in the classroom. But we found by working with experienced teachers and walking alongside them of how to teach differently using this technology, that's what really made the difference uh, in our department and then throughout the school. And the way that we sort of did it is we didn't really tell them that we we're going to put a smart board in their classroom. We just took the whiteboards that they had, moved them apart, and put the smart board up in the middle of the classroom and made it inconvenient to teach without using it. So uh, we kind of ruffled a couple feathers that way to begin with, but um, uh, it was amazing within a couple months, everybody in the department wanted one, and, uh, and then it sort of just took off from there, sort of this revolution of adjusting the way that you teach. Um, you know, we found, you know, with different teachers, it, it, the learning curve takes longer for some, shorter for others. Uh, and by continually, like Dave talks about having this free period, he uh, can go into teachers' classrooms and help them, you know, with some technical support, but especially with uh, support on how to teach differently using this device. And I, you know, we meet once a month. Uh, we always have time for technology to talk about, uh, you know, Dave and I are uh, smart exemplary educators, so we get a share with the network with other teachers who use smart technology, uh, and then we're also a smart showcase school, meaning we get a lot of groups coming in to uh, observe what it's like to have these devices, these interactive whiteboards in classrooms, so, that, you know, we need to be practitioners to talk about what we actually do, and I think that's the exciting thing of being able to go into other teachers' classrooms to give feedback on, um, you know, how do you implement this uh, technology, but then how are your students interacting with it? I think one thing you touched on, too, which is important, is having that sustained PD, you know, going back in and, and you know, maybe showing them something different, like whether that's, you know, the fact that they can record a lesson or it's got the screen capture tool or whatever it is to continually, 
you know, move them along and, and make them better uses of that uh, technology. Well, you know, and, and also to piggyback on that, how many schools um, provide the devices, but the professional development is just not there. I mean, you think about that they, they can get the devices in there, but they have to train, and change is slow in schools, and it takes, I think, a full year of using the interactive whiteboard before you're really even comfortable with it. And some people feel like, you know, they'll try it for a little bit, and well, I think it takes a whole year. I think, you know, it, it's going to be a slow process. You slowly dive into it. You don't change every single lesson. You're going to you're going to kill yourself because they take. Do you find that they take a lot longer to make than than the regular lesson? Yeah, I was just going to say that, David. That you know, when I was making lessons, it did. It, you're probably looking at least I spent maybe two hours, three hours putting everything together. So I think, you know, if you like you said, if you're a novice and you're just kind of getting into this, you really have to think, okay, you know, what can I do? What lesson's going to lend itself to using this interactive whiteboard? Not necessarily, you know, biting off more than you can chew or even just, you know, say go to the smart exchange, you know, look at some of those lessons, maybe modify one that somebody else created so you're not just starting from scratch because otherwise this is going to be collecting dust, you know, in the back of the classroom or in the front, wherever it is. Absolutely. Yeah, not to mention, that's, that's you know, great, great the point. fact that, uh, the fact that you know not everything that teachers teach is static you know they're, they're going to need to make changes to it constantly so if they you know have their lesson plan set in stone one year you know next year to go back and be able to change it uh, that's more work do they really want to you know migrate over to an interactive whiteboard so you know that uh, that additional work you're right really is a, a hump for them to uh, and I think you have to gradually build your repertoire of lessons, you know. You can't just, again, try to do every lesson. And um, I don't know about the other boards that we talked about in our last epi episode, but I know with the smart notebook you can import PowerPoints. So do you ever tell your teachers, you know, why don't you start there and maybe kind of modify a PowerPoint that you already have? Yeah, I, exactly. Uh, that's one way we find, you know, to get teachers acclimated to doing that, uh, especially when we've worked with social studies teachers that tend to have a lot of PowerPoints to start uh, from that standpoint. Um, you know, the other piece is, um, uh, you know, having, um, we've purchased some, you know, really inexpensive flatbed scanners uh, for classrooms so that teachers can take something that they've already written and import it then as a, a PDF right into the notebook file. Uh, what's interesting though is in terms of sort of the cost benefit of time is, yes, it takes a long time to, or more time I should say, to make a notebook lesson. But I find the cost benefit in terms of time is because I'm actually now able to adjust on the fly. Like Eric, you had mentioned, you know, I want to adjust the lesson that I'm going to use in the future. I actually do that in a notebook file instead of, you know, using post-it notes and a binder or something else like that. And then the change really never gets made. And then I even have, you know, as you become more experienced, you're ending up making the change from one class period to the next. Finding, you know, the timing was too long or too short or this interactive lesson piece had a glitch in it, and you can make the changes right there. And, and that you can link all those resources, too, you know, if you want to attach files or, you know, um, links to websites or that kind of, like you said, if there is, you know, you're teaching a lesson, let's say, converting, you know, an improper fraction into a mixed number, and you have to pull something else in, it's very easy to do, you know, to have that stuff ready, ready to go. You know, I wanted to talk about what you said about PDFs. Um, Scott, you said that we have these uh, flatbed scanners and I was just working with a veteran teacher um, yesterday he uh, our copiers uh, take um, and scan in uh, and make a, a PDF scan to our email and so he actually was taking a stack of his old um, worksheets that he had written by hand and he was putting them in the, the copier making a PDF and then smart notebook software has this feature where it uh, changes um, PDFs to um, smart board notebook files. And so he was doing that. And then that has all his worksheets right there. And I think making the change is a big deal for our veteran teachers. So selling it to them, I mean, this is, this is part of it. And any Word um, file can be done the same. But I'm thinking of the veteran teachers who just don't have Word files, they have written out lessons or written out worksheets. And so they can actually change it to notebook 
uh, software, and and then they're off and run, and they feel powered instead of you know this this mountain in front of them that they can't change. That's a that's a fantastic suggestion. Um, we uh, recently converted our um, copiers over as well, um, and uh, we have a, a new set of uh, copiers in our district that do exactly that. You're right, and what a wow! That's a that is a great idea for folks who have this whole stack of stuff that they've done. I, I know that. Um, like Scott said, we, we, we do have some of the flatbed scanners, and, um, and, and teachers will use those for that um, non-planned thing where you just you know, want to be able to grab something right away, put it in there, get it scanned in, and then get it up into the smart notebook. Um, and what I've heard from, from my teachers who do this, a lot of them are doing this in the elementary level, and th they're doing it uh, with student work okay, uh, to kind of grade it in class, not in any way to, to put the student in a bad light, but to, to show exemplary work to go through, to, to have good class discussions about it. And the idea being that you can annotate on top of it really is very helpful. So to be able to take real work, scan it in, put it up there, and then do all the annotation that you need on it has really been nice for them. But now hearing what you're saying, I love that idea because I know I, I was a math teacher. That's where I started off. Um, I've been at North Canton Schools for 20 years. I was a math teacher, an eighth grade math teacher for seven years before switching over to technology for the last 13. And I still have my math worksheets. I, I, I can't throw them away. I've gone through and I've thinned them out a little bit. But you know who knows with, with the way budgets are. I may be back in the classroom someday. <laughs> who knows? But, oh, but uh, I mean, I still have just, you know, boxes full of math worksheets that I made, and a lot of them were by hand. I mean, this was 20 years ago. A lot of them are just really cute little things I drew up and did and so forth. What a great idea just to take them down, scan them all in, and then you can you know, bring them up into Smart Notebook and then annotate on them and work through them that way. That's a great idea to help convert some of that old stuff over. Well, Probably even overhead transparencies too, Eric? <laughs> Uh, it was 20 years ago. I'm just saying that's yeah. the technology. Oh, no, no, of no, I had. You're absolutely right. No, no, absolutely. I I had loads of overhead transparencies, you know. And, and you tried to make them creative, and you'd have ones that go on top of others to show changes to stuff and all that. <laughs> no, absolutely, you know. There's no question about that. I don't think I had any of the things you had to crank with the blue ink, and it smelled funny <laughs> and all of that. I, I don't think you didn't have to set your press. <laughs> I just took it to the monks and I said, I need 20 by the morning, and they would just but, transcribe. You know, the, re the reality is that um, there's not only stuff we've made, but there's stuff that, that uh, is out there that's still good, but is, isn't digital. And so, you know, they're in notebooks somewhere that's, that's good stuff. I mean, I just used something algebra with pizzazz, and I know it's not digital, but I, I still, it was a worksheet, and I just used it. Uh, yesterday, so that's something that I could scan in there and, and put up on the board real easy. And then that's something too that we found, like with our uh, pre-episode survey, is a lot of the people, you know, in and around the state of Ohio are using that manner where they're scanning either students' work or they're scanning PDFs, like you said, and annotating over the top of it, and it's working out really well. Mm -hmm. I think that what's neat is the transformation that takes place for teachers is eventually over time uh, they're working with work that they've already had, you know, we're helping them make that adjustment of transferring it into notebook files, but then eventually teachers sort of flip the switch and then start planning a notebook software itself. And that's where um, it's neat to see the transformation that takes place for them in teaching uh, and then the transformation that takes place in the classroom. Going back to sort of a story, an anecdote that Dave and I have with uh, one of our colleagues, uh, he was planning on retiring, but then by installing a, a smart board in his classroom and then providing him with, you know, real-time professional development with, you know, little steps, he decided to stay longer and, and teach a few more years. So it's just fantastic. I energized him also. All right. Well, let's um, talk a little bit more about sort of the uh, manipulating of different objects, you know, in terms of probably you've seen that with math, maybe pulling some things in from the lesson activity toolkit or, you um, you know, we had a couple of people comment on our survey talking about being able to, for example, drag around the different organs in the digestive system and put them in the correct places on the body or for you know, creating an atom or, or especially for geometry. They seem to really love that. If, have you guys seen that or been using it in terms of using those, either those flash objects or different things from the gallery? Well, yeah. Um, I was going to say uh, that we especially like 
the fact that you can move things around on the screen. I mean, that is the power of uh, the, the interactive whiteboard. And when you uh, can put a, a bunch of things, items, on the screen and then have students try to sort things out, that really uh, is, is a terrific skill for students. Uh, so I have, OK, so I randomly select a student. That, that's a key for us. We randomly select a student. They come up to the board, and they uh, move something around, uh, let's say a sentence, and they put it in a, the right spot. And then they say, why did that work? And number one, if the student is nervous, they can bring up a partner. That's a huge thing with uh, interactive whiteboards. We believe that if they have the power to bring somebody up with them and always have that power, they're going to be a lot less uh, reluctant to come up. So we have them come up with their uh, partners, so, so to speak. And then they uh, move it, and then they justify why they put that there. When they do that justification, they're teaching uh, the rest of the class why things are the way they are. We have um, them go to the, their seat, and then have somebody else come up. We pick them randomly. And then they move things around. And they could even change what was done before. And so what you're talking about is moving things around the board is power. And it gives power to the students. They, they actually moved it. I mean, you can't do that with a whiteboard. You know, you do race, and uh, you actually moved it, and you say why. So I mean, I think that justification is huge uh, with our, our students, and, and the actual movability is also. You see that level of engagement going up, too, with the students? Absolutely, yeah. And that's a good point, is this random selection, too. I, know, I don't know how many teachers do this, but I think the randomness of it, it puts all the students on the same playing field. You know, whereas you sometimes have students always raising their hand. Well, if you are always picking them at random, I just use some cards. I just use some note cards, and they... Um, uh, you know, I shuffle those and pick one out and have a student come up. Yeah. Scott, were you going to say something? Yeah, I think also if you can take uh, a page and clone it several times. So if it's something that uh, is interactive uh, that one set of students is working with, then you can come to the same thing um, in the next page. And uh, really designing things that are more open-ended. Uh, I think that's the, the big change in terms of what the actual lesson activity that they're dealing with, you know, whether it's layering things, sorting things, writing things out, um, you know, repositioning things, uh, opening things up, using a, a flash notebook page that, like you said, you know, where you can move the organs of the body around, and then you try to, you know, uh, see if you can resuscitate the animal that you're working with, and it will either work or it won't, so it gives you some feedback that way. Um, but uh, again, the, the whole approach of changing from a stand and deliver model to now a model where the students are the ones who are drawing their knowledge base out in the classroom and sharing that with other students is really powerful and engaging. Um, <clears throat> along the lines of you know being able to move things around on the screen, I, I absolutely love what you're sharing there about empowering the students. Um, I, I have seen though also it empowering the uh, teachers in, in certain ways. Um, with uh, again going back to math, and I apologize if this is a little bit math centric today, but it's probably going to be with the panel we have here today. Um, but you know when you're solving equations, I mean you know you know how, how many times uh, I, I have seen some of our high school math teachers use this very well, where they're writing out the equation, they're solving it, and they decide, hey, I. I need to put another step in there. I need to show something to be able to just grab a line of the equation and move it down and insert something in it. You know, on a whiteboard, you're right. If, if I needed to make a change, I have to erase something. You know, or I'd be drawing arrows to say, well, in this part, do this. Just to be able to manipulate the text you have written and move it around and make room for new things. Um, it, it it may it may sound trivial, but I think it it gives a whole lot more power to that teacher to you know, be able to show how things work and per perhaps be recording it at the same time. And maybe we need to move into th that discussion as well as to do you guys do that? Now, Sean, you, you had a comment, though, before we, we leave, leave that point. I just want to piggyback, Eric, real quick on what you said. And um, 
you know, somebody had mentioned about, you know, doing Venn diagrams and T-charts on their interactive whiteboard, and, and they said in our, um, you know, in the survey that, yeah, you could use paper, but it's a lot easier to do it on the interactive whiteboard because, like you said, I, you can erase it very quickly, get rid of that text, or add something, and it's just more efficient than if you had a piece of chart paper or you're using your chalkboard. You know, I was going to say, um, with what you're saying uh, about moving things around in on the screen, that... Um, I use the camera, and I th suppose most interactive whiteboards have this feature, is a, is a little camera, and what I do is I do the problem, and then I take a picture of the question, and it goes to a new page, and then I do a whole nother way of the same problem. And so it's just so efficient, I instead of uh, you know just erasing or uh, s rewriting the problem, it's just um, it's so smooth that it works real well. Something that uh, I would mention is uh, Dave and I are very fortunate. We actually have uh, the dual touch smart boards in our classrooms. Um, and uh, that's also been tremendous to even adjust lessons even more of having two students or four students up at the board, um, sort of left and right hand side of something that you're working with. or um, And so the collaboration that takes place in front of the classroom is very evident. And then that gets translated to the students of now how they collaborate with each other, um, uh, you know, or or taking things apart, uh, making it into uh, puzzle pieces that are, uh, you know, fit back together to a larger problem to solve. And that again is you know any subject area, not just with mathematics. You know, um, I was going to say also about when we are helping students, um, actually teachers that uh, we have this uh, website called teachingwithsmartboard.com and we, uh, we try to empower the teachers uh, by giving them some templates. We have um, some pre-made templates so that if they wanted to uh, just bring up this template and then change some items on it, it's very easy to do uh, because it's, sometimes it's, it's um, daunting to, to look at uh, creating a whole lesson. So we, we provide these templates at the, the website teachingwithsmartboard.com and then they can uh, just double click and it goes right to their uh, smartboard and then they can type in uh, the, their, I, their content uh, with the, the kind of the, the shell that we already have provided for them. Um, and and uh, it's, it's worked out well. Eric, you had mentioned about the gallery. Uh, that's a big piece then of creating things, uh, dragging and saving into the gallery and then being able to drag and use it right there on the fly in the classroom. Um, whether it's a, you know, a pre-made annotation of a paragraph or a pre-made uh, graph that you're going to use in a, a math classroom is just huge because it's, and then it's also teaching the students as they're up there to use some of the tools interactively then also, that they're using the shape tool, they're using you know the equation editor, all of those types of things of getting them also acclimated to the power of the technology then too. All right. <clears throat> That's fantastic guys. Um, I, I know we had started uh, to head down the direction of, of recording things. Uh, are, you, are you guys doing that? Do you either do, you know, oh I'm done with my lesson and I'm going to convert all of the slides into a PDF, make those available. I know we have teachers in our district who do that. They simply uh, turn the slides at the end of the lesson into a PDF. You know, and that way, if it's maybe students need to review it later, somebody was absent. We've also had teachers who, you know, record their audio along with it and they turn it into a video file and you know uh, one of our math teachers would do that every day and post that up at, at the end of the day and the students again if they just need to hear it again or if they were absent they would be able to you know basically sit in on the lesson um, I'm not sure what uh, experiences do you guys have with that yeah I um, it's what you said with the uh, end of the the slides I actually change them to PDFs and post them on Google Docs and then there's just this big library of all the lessons I have um, and all the slides that are within those lessons. Uh, students really like that. If they're gone, they, they go to them. Um, I admire that teacher that, that uh, actually records. That's quite a, a lot of work, and, um, but it's great for students. I do have to say, um, 
Wednesday of this week, I used the uh, smart board recorder, which is just a screencast, um, and, and made the lesson. They actually watched it at night, uh, and then the next day we did the homework uh, in class, the flipped classroom. You've heard of that before. And that's, that was kind of interesting. And um, certainly I don't think I'm ready for it every day, but maybe every couple of weeks, I think it just, it really um, was a unique way to, to do it. Well, now that now that's really exciting to hear that because um, there is a lot of discussion about flipped classroom. There's a lot of discussion about blended learning. There's a lot of discussion about online learning. All of those are things that I know as a district we're looking at and we're excited about. But to make that transition to get there, you know, how, how do you do that? You know, that's such a great idea to say use these tools. Teach your class like you normally do, you know, perhaps, and maybe over the course of a year, not only would this be good for a kid who is absent or a kid who wanted to see it again, no, you could actually be building your digital curriculum. You could be recording your lessons. You could be doing all this so that the next year, maybe, okay, I'm going to take what I used last year, and we're going to, maybe it's flipping. Maybe I'm going to flip it. Now, this year, I'm going to let them watch the lesson that I taught last year. When they come into class, we're going to do a lot more interactive now because they've at least seen the lesson. Now, we're really going to dig into, you know, taking advantage of that time and having even more interactive or let's start offering blended learning or online learning let's do a digital academy you know how would you ever well we got to buy Florida virtual courses or we've got to do this well maybe not maybe just over the course of a year teachers with time and with training start digitizing their instruction in their curriculum um, I think that's a really neat idea Scott I think uh, another way too is that we've uh, taught our students in some classes at times to do screencasts themselves so they use the notebook recorder uh, they have a topic. They explain uh, the, uh, whatever problem-solving process, uh, and then they upload that uh, to our server. Uh, and then you know we can play those, uh, set them up as a video library, so that students are hearing their peers uh, walk through a problem. And the neat thing about it is, since it forces the student to explain the problem-solving process, is now you actually get to hear their reasoning instead of seeing it written down on paper, seeing it actual. And then visual representation followed with you know, followed up with audio is now you can find out, okay, I'm finding that I've got you know four groups of students that have the same misconception or they're using the incorrect vocabulary. And then now I, I can use that as a teaching tool in my classroom. Um, other ways that we've done it too is using you know flip cameras. Uh, you know, we have it's kind of neat, we have students actually write with dry erase markers on their desks and explain a problem that way with the flip camera. Uh, then we upload the videos and show those, you know, through notebook software uh, at times, and then start and stop, annotate, uh, and it's just a, a tremendous feature. Then to look at, you know, this is a, a tool in the whole repertoire of, uh, you know, engaging students in technology, and that, you know, another piece too is thinking, well, let's say I want to do stations in my classroom, especially in an elementary classroom. Well, being intentional of using the smart board as one of the stations in the classroom uh, as the students are maneuvering around. Just to kind of jump on what you guys are talking about, I know that teachers have been using it too for subs uh, pretty effectively. There's one uh, particular educator in Ohio that uh, we are all fond of, uh, Brett Gensberg, who I believe is also a smart exemplary educator. And I know he was using it when he was in the classroom to record a lesson if he knew he was going to be you know, on vacation or if, if he was sick. And then he would actually build those pauses into the audio. So he would call on students as he was recording it, you know, and then the sub would just play back the lesson, you know, he would say, you know, hey, Chris, or hey, John, you know, what's the answer to this, and, uh, you know, I think that's another great way to do it. If you have a sub, that's the other thing. I, I found that I didn't have too many subs who were actually pretty smart savvy or who, not, who knew who to, how to use an interactive whiteboard, but if they do, uh, you know, that, that's another way to use it if you can leave that lesson for them to just go back and, and play. Well, I think so also, you know, with it, it, sort of the file sharing uh, element then too of sending that file to another teacher uh, in your department or in your school, uh, you know, that is a helpful resource for them. They can update it, uh, change it. Uh, and I, I think, you know, as Dave mentioned about, you know, sort of the uh, teaching templates is really the focus that we try to push teachers to do is having at least one interactive activity that your students are up out of their seats and interacting with the smart board every day. I mean, that's the goal to set. Um, 
and that you know it just sort of grows from there. Uh, you know, and I'd say Dave and I try to have at least two or three uh, per class period. All right. Well, um, we've kind of talked a little bit about recording and, and some of the ways that you can manipulate the board with different objects. Uh, one of the things that was also mentioned was using it with interactive websites. And um, I was talking with Eric C. a little bit earlier before we started recording. And uh, one website that I really like is this BBK or BBC UK uh, Science Bites website. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or not. But they have a lot of really interactive activities. For example, that one is uh, it's like an open circuit, and you have to drag different items into that uh, circuit to complete it. So, you know, whether it's a conductor or uh, an insulator. And, uh, you know, that's one thing that would definitely lend itself to, I think, you know, using the board or um, the library of virtual manipulatives, which I'm sure if you guys are math teachers, you're familiar with that. That's also another excellent site. And I think, Eric, don't you have some of those that you were going to share? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, we... Um put smart boards in our kindergarten uh, this last year. We were very fortunate, had a, uh, a community donor who uh, wanted to have that happen, and so it was, it was a fantastic opportunity for us to get uh, smart boards into our kindergarten. And it was this all at once thing, you know, so it was a little different than, you know, oh, in the past, somebody gets a grant, and they become a lead teacher, and then they help others. It's out of nowhere, suddenly, all these teachers have smart boards, and they're like, oh, what do we do? <laughs> you know, and understandably, I mean, which makes sense. And so we wanted to give them some resources, and so several of us in the tech department, several of the teachers started trying to pull together some stuff. And you're absolutely right. There are, you've seen a change over time. It's like the chicken and the egg thing, where, you know, at first there were some neat websites that you could use on the smart board, but then because they were smart boards, neat websites started developing that were sort of geared toward that, you know, making manipulatives and making things that had nice big buttons. And when you go to those websites, you can tell they've been kind of tailored to use in a touch-sensitive environment. Uh, so, uh, you know, a couple examples I'll just pull up on the shared screen here real quick. Real quick, Like there's one called smartboardgoodies.com. And, again, I, I can't speak too much about these. I mean, I we, we found them. We thought they were useful. The kindergarten teachers have been using them. But like smart board goodies, basically, they just you know frequently post you know uh, some of the what they consider to be some of the best interactive websites that are just really geared toward uh, using on a smart board. And so you know they've got all these great websites they've come across that just really lend themselves well to that. So that'd be a quick example of one. Uh, again, I know these are young you know, kids, because I'm showing examples from our kindergarten, but uh, the uh, Utah Education Network has a, a K2 student interactive site where they've just pulled together loads and loads and loads of websites and all these different subject areas that are highly interactive that would really lend themselves to that, you know. And then beyond that, I mean, there's all sorts of other websites, um, and I'll just throw them up on the screen real quick here, but I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll bring these up. Uh, I'll, excuse me, I'll add these into our show notes. So please be sure to, as always, Check the show notes uh, for on the website, and we'll have links to all of these as well. And other folks on the panel, if you have some ones you love, please throw them in our in our Google Doc for the show notes, and I'll add them into the show notes on the website as well. Um, well what about you guys? Any other uh, resources that you try to point your teachers to uh, to help them in this transition to using the smart board? Oh, one of them you had up there was the Teachers Love Smart Boards uh, by, you know, we know Jim Hollis quite well uh, on his blog that he has uh, and, you know, and encourage teachers to subscribe to that. Uh, a lot of this stuff works really well for middle school and elementary teachers. Uh, there's, you know, you mentioned some of the other, you know, virtual manipulatives, library, and then also encouraging teachers of how to use, you know, some of the software that they have within the interactive, you know, whiteboard environment, you know, things like GeoGebra uh, for math classes, uh, using things uh, or Geometer Sketchpad or uh, working with, uh, you know, a virtual calculator or something like that of, you know, really stressing that then also uh, and then just keeping searching and going, you know, a lot of different ways, um, you know, uh, of different websites that are out there to access. Scott, why don't you talk about the virtual calculator for a little bit because that has been a quite a change uh, for us in mathematics. Yeah, uh, what you know, it's, it kind of happens at times. Well, you know, it happens in Dave and my classroom. I'm not sure if it happens with a lot of other teachers. Probably does. Is you have a student who doesn't bring a calculator to class, uh, so you sort of turn things around and uh, pull up a virtual calculator because uh, we're using it in class 
And we have a student then go up and interact with the calculator and then demonstrate and explain things. Um, and the, the big thing is now the students can see, you know, screenshot for screenshot of what your buttons are pressing, talking through that, and then what, you know, they should be seeing. You know, very different than the old overhead graphing calculator template, which was nice, but the students could never see what is the actual sequence of buttons that are getting pushed to demonstrate what, you know, how the graph came about. Yeah, and furthermore, um, the pace that we take when we are punching the calculator buttons up there compared to the pace that a student takes is so different, and we don't realize how fast we're going, and then the rest of our class is lost. We have a student up there punching the buttons. The other students can see them punching the buttons, and they're going at the same pace. So, wow, that has just uh, really impacted our math classrooms. And I suppose it could do as science as well. And the other thing, too, is you can grab a screenshot of the graph or whatever's on the calculator screen, just drag that right into the notebook document and then post that as a PDF, you know, for students who need, you know, some more resources to look through notes or other things like that or if they're absent. All right. Well, you know, um, one thing that has jumped out at me as you guys have been sharing this, uh, maybe it was a preconceived notion on my part, uh, but, you know, a lot of times I think about how young kids are so tactile, but I'm hearing you guys talk so much about uh, high school students, correct, you know, really enjoying going up and touching the board and using that. So uh, that's great to see uh, because we do hear a lot about how younger learners, really it's very great for them to be able to go up and touch the board and interact with it and they're very tactile and they, and they learn that way. But it sounds like this uh, works uh, K through 12, that uh, no matter how old you are, kids love to get up there and interact with the board. Scott? Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, and then uh, going on the other end of it, uh, students that have trouble with fine motor skills, um, you know, we recommend having a tennis ball in the classroom, you know, where they're having trouble in terms of, you know, for special needs students being able to touch the board at one, you know, touch point, and then grabbing the tennis ball and using that to manipulate things uh, on the board and, and everything else like that. You know, the, the tactile piece, you know, we, we're big at our high school, especially looking at the impact of movement on learning. Um, so within every class period, we also have students participate in brain breaks, um, you know, get up and out of their seat, um, whether it's with a partner or individual or a group. Uh, so then they get re-energized and blood flow back to the brain, uh, and they're ready to re-engage in learning. And we treat then the whole piece of students getting out of their seat, getting up to the board, and interacting with it in a tactile kinesthetic sense. This, again, fits right within our you know, our whole belief system of the more active a student is, the better off they're going to be in terms of learning things. Um, and since we were talking about, about resources, I definitely don't want to, uh, to, to miss the fact that, uh, to emphasize again, that you guys do a podcast specifically about smart boards. Uh, you guys want to just tell a little bit about that and make sure that everybody knows how to access that. I've listened to it, and I can definitely say it's, it's a great podcast, but love to hear from you guys a little bit more about it. Sure. Uh, you know, we, Dave and I, well, Dave actually came to my office a few years ago um, and uh, said, you know, I think we should start this, these podcasts for teachers uh, because, you know, we realized by doing some training with teachers that uh, so much of the money was put into the purchase of the devices, the hardware, that there was no, really no money left for, you know, software and understanding how to use the software and any type of professional development. So we started, decided to make these screencasts um, and to focus on a couple of different topics with each of them um, and then to publish them on the Internet for teachers to be able to access. Uh, and, you know, we found pretty soon that people all over the world were interacting with them and using them for training. Um, and, you know, the, within the podcast itself, you know, as we focus on, um, you know, maybe it's a template that we've designed, but it's really not just what the template is, but how do you use it in the classroom, and then especially how do your students interact with it in the classroom. And then, Dave, I think you can t talk a little bit about, you know, some of the other aspects of it, and then especially the humor that's involved, too. <laughs> yeah, right, well... 
we do a joke uh, each podcast and pretty poor jokes, to tell you the truth. But, <laughs> you know, sometimes corny jokes are a good uh, breakup of time. Uh, you know, the podcasts, um, they're nothing special in terms of quality uh, productions or anything. We just, uh, you know, we started out with using Smart Recorder. Now we use Camtasia. Um, and uh, we, uh, we found that we're, the communication, the, the content that we're giving, teachers want to know. They want to know um, how to, to more effectively use the interactive whiteboard in their, their classrooms. And so I think we're at number 86, right, Scott? Yeah. And we're marching towards 100 very, very slowly. We, you know, we were trying to one one a week for a while. And, I mean, you guys, I, I don't know what podcast you guys are on now. Is it, is it, uh, what number are you on? Ten? Okay. So that is impressive because we're marching are, slowly I mean, towards hundred too. <laughs> <laughs> ours are uh, maybe fifteen minutes long, and uh, as we've neared a hundred, we're. Yeah, you know, I keep telling Scott I'm ready to be done, but uh, he said, "Oh, we're going to do. We're going to get a hundred, and so so we're, we'll see." But um, you know, I think teachers really want to know how to get better, and they they. They're using their own time. They're uh, they're looking into different strategies that will help them. I mean, the uh, we're just trying to help, and and we enjoy it. And um, you know, I don't know. And I, and I think that's key. You know, even if like you said, you can't afford, you know, the professional development. The fact that you guys are doing that and putting that out there that teachers can go and watch, and if they just want to learn one little snippet or one little tidbit of how to use their board better. That's huge. I, I think what's uh, also been neat too is to you know you'll you'll go to a professional conference somewhere, um, you'll be sitting beside somebody at you know it's a, a session about using a smart board or an interactive whiteboard, and then you know in conversation you know you mention your name, and then they're like, oh, I've heard about you know your podcast and screencasts, and they've been so useful, and that's I think just been tremendous to hear feedback from people on how they've been able to take what we've offered and then take and adapt it to their own classroom. But I think it's just the feedback of hearing teachers being able to, you know, you're never sure, like I'm sure you guys are, of how, how far reaching is this? Is it making a difference for people uh, with the time and effort and energy that you're putting in? Um, I think another thing to mention too is that on our, you know, our um, our uh, website, teachingwithsmartboard.com, we have some other resources. We actually have a print book uh, of the you know, easy interactive teaching templates for teachers to use, and then also some notebook files uh, for teachers to work with them too. Um, and it's you know, to try and provide as many resources for teachers to use that you know, don't have a whole lot of access to of things that they're able to have because of lack of resources in their own educational setting. Hey, I want to turn the tables for a second. You guys have done this for 10, 10 sessions now. What, uh, what things have you enjoyed uh, and um, learned along the way that, that has, uh, in this journey of, of podcasting? Well, I tell you, it's, it's absolutely been a benefit for my district. I mean, just for totally selfish motives. I mean, if nothing else, and I truly, truly do believe, yet yeah, people are benefiting from it. It is helping folks. And, and, and if not, I mean, you know, we sort of have to question, you know, why we're doing it. But even if nothing else, just getting to meet guys like you, just getting to meet folks like Carrie Herod from Forest City on BYOT and getting to meet, you know, all these other people. You know, we've had folks on from California. We've had to bring that kind of knowledge back to my district because you know basically what I do is you know I share these podcasts as well with the teachers in my district and I I learn you know this is my professional development I'm learning so much from you know having to dive into these issues you know we've talked about Google Apps we've talked about BYOT and we've talked about creative tech support we've talked about tablets and we've talked about oh who knows what all else all kinds of great things we even did one on on technology and math a few episodes back which was which was great um, and so you know for just even selfish reasons it has been wonderful for me to learn so 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 much that maybe in the normal daily grind of being a tech director I you know I just wouldn't have had the time to get out and research all these sites and talk to all these people but it's brought this information together so if it's helping us that way I truly do hope it is helping others as well how about the others of you? 
Uh, it's, you know, the groupies, uh, I'm just saying. Um, no. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Eric 100% that the benefits of, uh, you know, just getting the information um, there. You know, we don't have any answering questions in the normal day at work to uh, to do all this research. And, you know, if our guests or, you know, one of the other group members, uh, team members does it for us, that's that's fantastic. So I'm a part. Yeah, and I don't want to sound like I'm copying you guys, but certainly, you know, I do professional development. I mean, that's my job. I go into schools and, and work with districts and, uh, yeah, to learn new things. And certainly, you know, we do our awesome thing of the week segment. And I'm, you know, Eric Kurtz might share a website or Eric might share, uh, you know, a gadget that he just got on QVC. And, you know, <laughs> you, you, you learn about that new stuff. And it, and it's, it is. It's enriching for me, you know, and, and also for, for what I do for a living. So, it's been real great, and uh, you know the only thing I think that I've learned besides all that great knowledge is just you know you gotta kind of fly by the seat of your pants and things change, and um, you know I always think there's stuff that we could do better in an episode, but you know you don't get that do-over. You just gotta kind of go into that next one and think, okay, you know what am I gonna do to improve? And but uh, I think we're we're kind of getting into the groove. I think uh, hopefully by the time we do our live one at eTech, we'll be uh, we'll be a well-oiled machine. So. Well, I just think uh, it's great that you, I mean, it's Saturday morning, and obviously you guys are taking your own time here, and I, I, I think it's great. I think the uh, the people you're influencing it are really appreciating it. Eric Hurts actually has malaria, so. Yeah, I'm I'm the one that's sick today. We kind of take turns getting sick, and so I've, I'm on about 10 different medications at the moment, so I'm going to have to watch this back and see what I said, because I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but um, and I guess the last thing I'll say about all of this is that I, I hope that um, as much as people are hopefully learning from this podcast, I hope one thing that they're learning is that, you know, they are experts as well. You know, I, I don't want, I mean, all five of us, we're just regular dudes right now on the on this podcast. I mean, you know, sure, we, we've all got specialties and so forth, but we're just working people. We're doing our job. We're trying to do that. And that's what I love about it is we get to, to bring people like that on, folks from all over the state of Ohio and outside of Ohio. We've really branched out just who are doing their job day in and day out, and they are showing that they are, you know, they have something to, to contribute. And so when we are at the live eTech show, I certainly hope folks from the audience will come up on the stage and join us when we have that, that opportunity to do so, so they can share something neat that they've learned at the tech conference and so forth. I guess the point is I just want to encourage people to realize that everybody out there has amazing things to offer because they are educators and we're all educators at heart. But And thank you guys so much for taking your time to be with us today. All right, uh, David, I think you wanted to mention some, something about the uh, mouse and interactive slate. Yes. Okay, I've used um, the interactive uh, the whiteboard, the slate. And I just didn't like it. I really didn't. And so it's kind of in the closet. And if if you don't know what that uh, the um, you know that actually is you know you write on it just like a a tablet kind of, and it, then it works on the the smart board. Well, for me, I just learned two weeks ago that my wireless mouse works from the back of my classroom. And since it works from the back of my classroom, it's so much easier to use. That, and I've had one of those pointer things, you know, those laser pointer things that you you know move around with your thumb, and, and that was not very user friendly either. So I, those didn't work. So I put use this mouse. Um, a, a colleague told me about it, and I just go to the back of the room and I help a student that's up at the front of the board. And Wow, that has given the student much more power because then I don't have to rescue them. How many times do uh, students get up there and you have to walk up there and rescue them? Well, now I'm just in the back, and actually uh, the colleague that told me about it, he just uses it on his pant leg if if uh, need be. You know, he just wherever he is in the room, he's got his wireless mouse. Uh, mine is a Logitech, um, and I know some don't work from the back of the room, but um, I, I think. Wow, it's it's a uh, it's revolutionary for me. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I was gonna say, do, do you guys remember they actually used to, didn't they include a Bluetooth mouse with the first uh, airliners? Yes, they did. And you were supposed to. Were you supposed to? I think could you were you supposed to use it on top of the slate, or were you supposed to use it on your on your pants leg? That seems to be like the uh, go-to mouse pad. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the only thing I would say about the uh, airliners and other slate things like that is it does seem to depend on the person. Um, it's 
we've got some teachers that it just makes sense to them, you know, and, and they totally get it. Maybe people who come from more of a, uh, maybe they've, like, art teachers who have used, is it Wacom or Wacom, W-A-C-O-M, Wacom, Wacom. Wacom. Yeah, I, I, I pronounced it wrong two times, and, okay, very good. So, um, <laughs> I found both ways to say it wrong. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the Wacom tablets, because you can't see on the tablet what you're doing. You have to watch the screen while you're touching it. So for some folks, that just clicks in their brain, and they've even mentioned how they love to just walk around the classroom with that tablet because it gives them the ability to do everything they would normally do on the smart board, but to be mobile while they're doing it. They're in the back of the room. They're next to a kid. They're, you know, and you know, if you're a teacher, a kid gets off task a little bit, starts, you know, not paying attention. How powerful it is just to walk and stand next to a child, you know. I mean, we all know that. You know, that kid brings them back on task. So to be free to walk around the room. Those who that makes sense to them and they're comfortable with that and then they give it to students, you know, and the students can write on it. Um, but, you know, what, what, whatever the case, um, I think one thing we are now starting to see is folks who are combining like an iPad with the Apple TV with the smart board software and with the smart board. And so at that point, you're now using uh, a splash top as a remote desktop client. And so you're seeing on the iPad what is on the screen. So you're not having to look at the screen while touching it blindly. You actually now can just be touching the iPad and controlling it. And so you're starting to see some really neat combinations of technology. Yeah, and, and I understand that. I um Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, I just know that these cost ten bucks or fifteen bucks, and when you give it to a student, they know how to use it. Whereas the slate, I've given them to students, and they're like, "What? Well, I don't know. I don't know how to use this." And so it's there's a learning curve for the students if you're using it for them. But uh, I understand some teachers, it's probably very beneficial. Just an option, though. Wireless mouse, give it a shot. Yep, one of the uh, suggestions I was going to make was the, uh, and um, it's, you know, we use this at Vandalia a little bit, and it's actually, you know, uh, motion controlled. So you stand at the back of the room and really no need to use the pant leg uh, to do it <laughs> because it actually, you just wave it in the air like a remote, and it's uh, pretty impressive. So a little more quickly than a wireless mouse, but, you know, does the same thing. There are other mice or, and remote presenters that come with uh, laser pointers and things like that, too. So definitely I think cheaper Eric, you than a slate or a, or a tablet. Yeah, go ahead. You, you had mentioned using the mouse in conjunction with a wireless keyboard at one point, didn't you? And that was working out pretty well, you know, being able to be yep, mobile. You know, and, and, and the, the interesting thing that not a lot of folks realize about this is you can have a large number of wireless mice and keyboard plugged into one PC at a time. Um, USB actually handles, I think it's up to 128 devices at a time. So if you, you know, just dropped a little bit of cash um, and bought, 10 sets of wireless keyboards, or let's say we have five or six rows of students, there's a wireless keyboard mouse combo in, in every row, they're all plugged in, you know, they can just pass them around, I mean, you don't see six mice on the screen at one time, you only, you know, have the option, you know, one keyboard controls that one mouse uh, and, and uh, interactivity between the keyboard at a time, but the fact that, you know, that all works at the same time, it's a pretty neat, pretty neat technology, so, and cheap. Uh, I think one other, uh, you know, device that we'll use that's just been amazing with an interactive whiteboard then is using a student response system. Um, you know, Smart has a smart response. There's other companies that have those devices too. And it, that uh, just in change of moving to a lot more formative assessment in the classroom, students getting immediate feedback, uh, having that integrated into a lesson, it's just amazing uh, in terms of the student's checking for understanding, uh, and then, you know, I, the big piece about that is um, when students go over the answers, uh, you know, the discussion that takes place, um, the, you know, the students are actually talking about the answer that they came up with or asking other students, how did you come up with that answer? Can you explain that to me? Just, you know, completely change the engagement level in the classroom when it comes to assessment. All right. Well, listen. I think we are uh, about out of time. Uh, Eric Eric Kurtz is actually turning purple. I'm not sure that's that's healthy. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to uh, David and, and Scott. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And definitely uh, check out you know the your your podcast. You know our listeners hopefully will will dig into that. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. Hey, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. And you guys, uh, good luck to you and, and have a great day.
Yeah, thank you very much. All right, and uh, here to tell us about some of our upcoming episodes is Eric C. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, next episode is that special one. We keep talking about it and mentioning it. Um, it is going to be our live recording at the ETEC, um, Ohio State Technology Conference. Um, and again, that is Tuesday, February 14th. I apologize, last episode we had, we had said February 15th. It's Tuesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. We love technology. I love the show. It just all fits together. Just be a love fest all around. Uh, but we're really, really appreciative to the folks at ETEC. They are setting us up on on the main stage in Battelle Hall with a professional recording crew and everything. I mean, I, I, I really thank you guys very much. They're, they're taking this very seriously and doing a really, really nice production for us there. And so the focus of it is going to be the best of eTech. And so the idea will be we'll be sharing some of the, the newest, neatest things that we've seen from the vendor floor, from the sessions we attended, just the, the, the most awesome stuff, basically, that we're seeing at the eTech conference. But we're also going to have an opportunity for folks to join us. And so anybody who comes to that live recording, be thinking of things you've seen at eTech that you thought were really, really awesome. And we're going to try to get you to pop up there on the stage and share with us real briefly something else awesome that you have seen from that. So that is uh, going to be, again, February 14th, Tuesday uh, in Battelle Hall, sometime around 1.15 or 1.45. I apologize. We're not positive on the time. We've heard two different times. So it's going to be sometime sh shortly after 1 o'clock when, when that happens. Um, as far as episodes coming up after that, we don't have anything set in stone as to the topics because what we're probably going to be doing is sending out another survey like we did when we first launched this. We've just hit our 10th episode. We're coming up on six months of doing this, and we'd like to kind of step back and reevaluate and hear from folks again as to what you would like to hear about. When we very first launched the podcast, that's one of the first things we did was we sent out a, a survey saying what topics are important to folks. And so we're going to be doing that again, and we would love to hear from people about what would you like us to dig into in, in our episodes coming up here in the future. So keep an eye out for that as well, and we always appreciate your feedback. Speaking of which, uh, uh, Eric G., I think we do have some uh, listener feedback you can share with us. Yes, yes, absolutely. We got a couple of uh, emails, and uh, Derek Myers, the tech coordinator from Twin Valley, actually emailed me and said, hey, I've been watching State of Tech podcast ever since the first podcast, and uh, last week he was talking about... Um, or he's mentioning how uh, both TJ and I and uh, Sean are using the Apple TV uh, in the classroom, and his question was, is, uh, you know... That does that have have to operate on a different VLAN? And of course, um, you know, I use the amazing Meraki network uh, as well as Eric C. And uh, yes, uh, I emailed you back, Derek. But what it does is, as long as your iPad and, or iPod Touch, as well as the Apple TV, are all on that same, uh, I put them on one SSID, but on that same network, yes, it works just fine. Uh, he also wants to know about, um, uh, you know, using. Uh, uh, having it connected or connecting to wireless and you know I have an Apple TV at home and it is plugged in and uh, it works just fine but you know wireless uh, using it wireless at the school there is just a touch of lad, uh, lag uh, but that's only when we play Angry Birds on the big screen so other than that that's no, just fine um, an additional um, just kidding we don't play Angry Birds not, not during school time um, we also have another uh, listener feedback message from Brian Shaw tech coordinator at Winsfield Goshen local schools and he says I uh, was finally able to watch uh, all the state of tech podcasts this week so uh, hope you didn't burn out your eyes watching every episode and uh, it, he says uh, you'd have to say that we did some nice work guys so we should all pat each other on the back for that one I'm except Eric I'm not going to touch you because I just got over uh, sickness so um, including the tech predictions one. So, hey, we thank you for watching, guys, and um, we appreciate you. Keep on watching. Um, as we mentioned, you know, as far as uh, getting in contact with us, uh, we always want to uh, let you know that the ways that we um, have available to contact us. Um, one is by phone. It's 513-318-TECH. That's 513-318-8324. You can also contact us on Twitter at the state of tech or you can send us an email at the state of tech at gmail.com don't forget that our show notes are still available online at the state of tech dot org uh, again as Eric mentioned uh, there's also the surveys you know please take those because that's where we really get all the information for our state of tech podcast and if you would please leave us a comment on our blog or email us let us know if you
any questions. Again, as I mentioned on one of the previous shows, if there's a mailing list that, that you think the state of tech should be a part of, add us to that mailing list. Let us know and keep our distribution high. Lastly, uh, rate us on iTunes because we'd like to stay up there as far as the state of tech goes. We're, we're pretty high in the rankings, but hey, we're not number one yet. So thank you for watching the state of tech. This has been the state of tech, and we hope to see you live at eTech in another few weeks. This next state of tech.